All right. Welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green. Make sure you subscribe so you see all these great uh, interviews and get notifications. There's 50 interviews on my channel right now. You know, I was thinking I get to speak to some amazing musicians almost every day of the week. And I've heard some incredible stories and some of the backstories, not even the stuff uh, that they're known for. You just find out some incredible stuff. But out of all these musicians, and some of them have had some, uh, they've done a little acting, they've done a little music, we've had a little of everything. But we have never had a musician on the show yet who has co-starred with Tom Cruise, with Steve Martin, with Kate Hudson. Those are pretty heavy hitters. And speaking of heavy hitters, you got to have a great drummer on the show today. So in just a second, Johnny Fedovich, after this. All right, we're not wasting any time, even though that's the name. Here he is, Johnny Fedovich. Hey, hi. <laughs> it's, uh, it, you know, when you introduce somebody in front of an audience, you, you get cheers. When you do this, you know, virtually, it's just like- I don't hear oh. it, I don't hear it. Yeah, I'm gonna have to get some, some sound effects. Anyway, I'm really glad, you know, we were talking a little bit before we, we just started this, that you've been in Vegas for 27 years. I've been here for 21 years. And somehow our paths really haven't crossed as far as working together. That's true. I and mean, I've, you, known, I've known of you and what your projects are and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's, I always follow what you guys are doing and stuff. But I'm just involved with projects that always take me away from Vegas and bring bring me back. And then you call yeah, me. And and we've, you know, I've reached out a few times. And, yeah, you were busy, which true. is the best thing. To be a working musician is a is a being busy is a good problem to have. But but this year we're gonna we're gonna work on some stuff together. Sounds um, good. Now I listen. I know that people are tuning in because they want to hear about Almost Famous. I want to hear about Almost Famous. But before we get to the movie Almost Famous, we're gonna go back to Ohio because you had your own band and your own career that was Almost Famous. So tell me what it's like growing up in Ohio. And I can't even pronounce the city you grew up in. So you tell me. So I grew up in between Canton and Massillon, Ohio. And that's in Northeastern Ohio, about an hour south of Cleveland. And um, Perry Heights to be exact. So it's right between uh, Canton and Massillon. And growing up there is great. I loved it. I'd, I'd pretty much go back right now if I, I could do it. <laughs> yeah, if there were gigs. Uh, yeah, um, but I had great, teachers back there, uh, drum teachers. I had great people that I infiltrated and got into with playing music with, you know. Um, I started original rock bands back there, played in Cleveland, Ohio, played in Akron, Ohio, traveled all over Ohio and stuff. And I love Ohio, dude, so. I'm yeah, you know, I'm from the East Coast myself. New York, yeah. though, close enough, you know, spent some time in Ohio. Yeah, um, dude. So wh what age do you know you want to be a drummer? Probably around 13. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting into rock and roll. I'm getting into, you know, Kiss. I'm getting into Blondie. I'm getting into Rush. I'm getting into the gods. I'm getting into the rock and roll bands because I have an older brother and sister. So they're like putting records down and, and I'm listening to them. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. I like this. And then, um, so my brother starts playing guitar and, you know, of, of course I'm at that time I'm getting into Van Halen, you know, and I'm like, Oh my God, there's Alex Van Halen is a drummer. Eddie's a, his brother. He's a guitar player. We could do that. So I always thought in my head that my brother and I were going to jam out and rock out in a band together. And, and we, and we obviously did play together at my parents' home in our basement and stuff a lot. Um, but, uh, that's the start of everything for me, you know, I, and, um, did you guys never do a band together? No, nah, we never did a band together. You know, we had parties at the house and, you know, and sometimes my brother and I would, people would want us to play. So we'd play like, uh, music, you know, whatever you actually Michael Stanley band, which you probably have never heard of. There's a, a regional rock and roll icon in Northeastern Ohio. Michael Stanley we used to jam on music by him and stuff. And, uh, that's funny. Yeah, it's totally, totally awesome. But um, um yeah, so that, was, that was the catalyst for like me, like, you know, I was always playing with guys that were like way older than me and stuff. And um, 
because of uh, just my brother. And then, and then I, I actually ended up doing a, a church gig with my mom because she was in the a folk group there. And I, so my, one of my first gig was on in this Catholic church on the, you know, down from the altar with my drum kit, we're playing some, a couple, a couple folk songs. And, uh, and it just started from there, man. And then it just started meeting people. And I started getting, I was like, in tune with how to like, you know, meet people and connect and interact and Hey, you want to jam? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Come over to my house. And you know, you know, this is when I'm like 15, 16. I'm not even a drive. I can't even drive at this time, you know? So yeah, it, yeah. it, it helps to have older uh, siblings, relatives, friends yeah. to influence you. Yeah, totally, totally, man. I mean, if I, 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 I owe that, I owe my sister and my brother a lot because they exposed me to a lot of music and a lot of art. So, and you were definitely into a lot of different cool things like your drum influences. I, you know, I know you're way into Clem Burke, but then you're into some of the more guys like Neil Peart, you know, so you definitely have a lot of a variety of influence. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. I mean, back then it was Ringo Starr. It was um, a Topper Heaton from The Clash, you know, a lot. I mean, and um, and then uh, local drummers too, man. You know, you you, you, you if you expose yourself to live music and watch a drummer, it's like you'll learn. You can learn so much <laughs> just yeah, by being in a club watching watching a guy play and stuff. Um, a lot of drummers like that. There's a band back in Ohio called Love Affair, and uh, I used to open up for them. And their drummer Michael Hudak, who's freaking awesome. I, I just I really got learned a lot from him as well. So yeah, you paid, you paid your dues. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Was, uh, was the Zooters the first sort of band where things were starting to take off? Uh, yeah. I mean, let's see. Yeah, I, I suppose so. I was in a bunch of original bands prior to that. I think that's what Mike and CJ like about me knowing me in Northeast Ohio that I, I was, I was predominantly in original rock bands and stuff and, you know, sideline gigs and cover bands and stuff too. But, um, and when the opportunity came up to join up with Mike and CJ, I was like, Oh yeah, man, I love you guys' writing style. I'll, I'll, I'll A do band that. Of brothers. Yeah. Brothers. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. So yeah, we, we spent a lot of time developing songs, writing and playing and showcasing and all that. We moved back and forth to LA, back to Cleveland, back to LA. We had an apartment there that we kept and then we'd lose a bass player <laughs> or something. So we'd go back to Cleveland and audition bass players and then come back out to LA and live out there for a while. So yeah, it's a, it was a process back then, you know, and you guys, a lot, of guys a lot of guys that did that, you know, I'm not saying that it was something new or anything, but. Well, yeah, but to the, yeah, I think the, the, the uh, average person just watching is thinking, well, that's a lot, sure. A lot of work that goes into it, not an overnight. Oh, yeah, a lot, a lot of uh, things that you just, um, uh, what do you, what do you call it when you like, well, I can't, I can't go to your birthday or I can't go to your wedding. I have to, I have a gig or I have a, you know, it's a lot yeah, of fun. life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, you know, and I'll sum it up a little bit, but you did, you guys had some uh, record label interest. You definitely had some interest in Japan. I think you had some records out. In oh, Japan. Yeah. yeah. We got a distribution deal, uh, with JVC records out there and released um, a record and then a second record and stuff. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did all yeah, that. Paul Gilbert from Mr. Big producing. Right, right. Yep. Yeah. And then that, that led into me playing on a couple records with Paul, which is friggin' awesome. So I played on a uh, flying dog with him. And then he had a, he had a side blues thing called uh, raw blues power with his uncle. And we did a whole record there. So I played on two of his records too. That was cool. He's one of those incredible musicians. You know, there's a lot of guys who can play fast or play tricks or do this and that. But I think that the, he, that guy can play, you know, he'll, he'll do a Ramones medley into a Spice yeah. Girls song into Black Sabbath and then shred with a drill if you want. Yeah, he's ultra talented, man. Totally. Yeah. So definitely some cool opportunities. So now, okay, so we, we got to talk about how you get involved with this movie, Almost Famous. It's 21 years ago, which yeah. seems crazy. This movie okay. is such a part of people's uh, growing up and lives. And it means so much to so many people. So you got to tell me, how does this happen? Okay, so go 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 back to what I was saying when I got that gig at church with my, with my mom playing in a folk group. I met a guy there who was a guitar player in that band. We went over to another guy's house, jammed out. And then this guy walks in 
playing guitar, Mark Kozlik, who is also casted in almost famous Larry Fellows. He's the bass player. So Mark Kozlik and I had an original rock band back then too. So that's how I, so that was, that's like the initial meeting. Mark and I met up. So we put the bands together, rock, you know, rocked out and played gigs. We had a band called Shtick. <laughs> played at the, played at the Jackson uh, Roller Rinks, the skatery, you know. Um, so fast forward, you know, years later when I'm out here in Vegas and I get, and my, uh, Mike Zuder and CJ and I are going to go play the Coconut Teaser doing original music. And Mark Koslick's in town doing a record that he's doing on Island Records. He's in a band called Red House Painters. Yeah, he was very well known for Red House Painters. Absolutely. And on a whim, I just called Mark. And said, hey, Mark, I know you're in town. I know you're doing mixing a record or something. Come check out. I haven't seen you in friggin' 20 years, 15, 15 20 years. My band's playing Coconut Teaser. Come out. So he came out. And then he's like, hey, man, I got to tell you, I'm in town. I auditioned for this movie, and uh, I think you'd be great for, for the drummer part of this film. So um, he's like, why don't you um, – would you be open to that? I'm like, I guess so. I've never acted, man. I don't know. So sure enough, the casting he, – he fed my name to the casting director. She called me. That's how it, that's how it stopped, stopped started. Mark was in town. He was – he was auditioning for Almost Famous, and he said you. And he just gave my name to the casting director because he thought I'd be a good match for the film, and that's how that's all it was, man. It just fell in my lap. Right no, it's totally amazing, man. Yeah, how I had, I had to audition, though. I mean, that being said, I mean, I know I know a couple of other world famous drummers that were up for that role, and I was just like, you sure you don't want those guys? <laughs> you know, so yeah. But, um, well, well, tell us some of the names because I've heard some of these. Well, uh, the Sean Kinney from Alice in Chains was one cat, and I think Stephen Perkins was another. Um, and then there were some actors too, but I, I can't remember who who they were. But I was like, yeah, and, you know, Sean Kinney makes sense also because of Cameron Crowe and his Seattle absolutely action. Um, absolutely, but, yeah. But so you do go in and you had a read. Now in the movie, obviously, you know, for, for, spoiler alert. You're you're like the Charlie Chaplin of rock movies, but you you yeah. have one famous line, but you did have to read and, and show that you can act to an extent. Right, I did. Yeah, yeah, that was weird too because when you know they sent me the lines and stuff, and then I'm like, I'm learning the lines. I'm like, oh, okay, I got this, I got this. But like, I didn't rehearse enough with the script with another person like interacting with me. So when I went in the casting office, uh, Gail. Uh, was the casting director and she's she's reading the the uh, opposite of what I'm you know supposed to react to and that like threw me for a minute it's like oh wait someone's responding to what I'm saying yes okay so I had to like adjust a little bit like, hey, okay I got this I got this man so that was, that was, that was, kind, of, that was kind of weird thing because I'm not you know I'm not an actor man I didn't take acting lessons or anything like that you know so, yeah it's uh it's a, it's it probably similar to when you're younger and you're learning music and you're learning at home playing along to the tracks and then you play with a live band and you go oh wait these people are here too and yeah, after, yeah. But, then, but then it's like oh I like this I like yeah. you know what I, mean? I like everything else that's going on yeah yeah well and acting is supposed to be all reaction but when you're doing your lines by yourself you go oh yeah now I have to listen to this other person and and right you know. it's a whole other thing man yeah totally so so how was the process so you do the audition. How did you feel when you left? I felt really good because Cameron and I really hit it off really well, man. You know, we were talking about drummers and we were talking about Hart and who our favorite drummers in Hart were and stuff because he was with Nancy at the time. And um, and just just drummers we liked, you know, and music. You know, he's obviously a music guy. So and likewise, you know, and we were just talking about music. And um, so I felt good. And I went home, but I, I didn't, I, my, you know, my, my phone wasn't ringing for like a couple of weeks. You know? So I was like, I don't know, man. I probably didn't, I probably didn't get it. And then like the third week or so, Cameron called and left a message on my answering machine. Right. When we had answering machines. And I was like, holy shit, I got the gig. <laughs> so um, that was it. Yeah. He, and he said, he was like, hey. So, you know, we did the audition stuff and I just want to know, do you want to, do you want to do a movie with me? I'm like, mm, okay, yeah, that sounds good. 
<laughs> and so he was and real it, nonchalant about it. And like, oh, that's awesome. So. Yeah. And you, you know, you probably grew up watching Cameron Crowe movies. Obviously, oh, yeah. you know, he wrote Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Absolutely. Uh, say anything. You know, these are massive parts of, of, of that. Yeah. In the, the 80s. So, okay. Oh, yeah. So he calls you up. He tells you you got the part, which this is amazing, obviously. Yeah. Do you have... Do you have an idea now of where the part is going to go? Because I heard he didn't let people take the scripts home in the beginning. No, 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 nothing. No, but he did say, do you mind Do you mind if your character's, uh, when he was on the phone, when I actually called him back, he did say, do you mind if your character's gay? I'm like, uh, I guess, no, I guess not, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, no, fuck it. <laughs> so um, then uh, the process was after that, waiting and then, moving me to uh, Marina Del Rey. They set me up in an apartment out there. And then we did, then we did the, re the reading down at, uh, at the uh, studio where Cameron's uh, production offices was, yeah. Yeah, but now, so he, he lets you know that the character's gay, but what about that the character is pretty much silent? When do you find yeah. that out? Yeah, I, I guess not until when we, when we finally got there and started and started working on stuff. I, 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 that's, that's a hard, that's a hard memory to remember about, you know, to figure out. I don't, I don't remember when he told me that. I mean, yeah. I didn't have a problem with it, you know, and it was like, it's like, shit, I don't have to learn lines. That's, that's freaking awesome. <laughs> you know? So. Well, I was thinking about that, Johnny. I'm, I'm thinking in some ways, this is the greatest blessing in a way. So you don't have to remember any lines, but yet you are in 70, 80% yeah. of the movie. You're in all yeah. the scenes that matter. You get to do what you love, which is play drums. Yeah. And then go on this long experience. And, and you'll tell me, but I think the movie took like seven months. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? Cameron did come up to me and go, dude, you have the hardest job on, on set right now because you have to express yourself by not saying anything. I'm like, yeah, okay. I get that. So I had to do facial you know, expressions and raise my eyebrows or give a look. And he and I think that's what he I think that's what he uh, liked about uh, maybe my audition my audition as well because maybe he knew that I wasn't going to say anything. So um, yeah, you had the look. He, he didn't pay me that compliment. You know, he's, you got a hard you have a hard job right now because you can't say anything, express yourself on film. You have to do it all without saying anything and use facial expressions. So, but uh, yeah, yeah, and obviously, and you, and you pulled it off because your character. Ed Valancourt has, there is a charm to the character that he's always sort of there and famous scene where everyone's singing Tiny Dancer on the on the bus. Obviously you're not singing. Wow. I know, I know, right? I'm like, Cameron, am I supposed to sing? No, no, don't sing, don't sing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, well, we're gonna jump around with, it, with this movie obviously a little bit, but one of the yeah. funny things is, have you heard what, um, what the his, uh, his vision, Cameron's vision, is of where the band is now. He said something about me playing in North Hollywood or something, right? Some like tribute to Stillwater or something. Yeah. So he said that he imagines that you know Russell would have definitely went solo. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, and then the the Jason uh, the 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 BB band, the Jeff BB band, would be b back together, and oh. that Stillwater would continue. With Silent mm -hmm. Ed yeah. as the only original member, you know, fronting the band. Yeah. Which is so timely to bands th these days, you know, where it, it, sure. it's totally a, 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 something that could happen. Absolutely. One, one, one original member or something. And that's, yes. Carries, uh, yeah. carries the name. And, you know, there's a few bands that attempt that. I mean, I believe the Yardbirds tour with a drummer, you know, right. and so it's, it, it, it's, I think Cameron is very alert of what's going on absolutely, out absolutely, absolutely. in the rock world. Yeah. So, okay. So you find out you're going to be in this movie and this is going to take seven months of your life. Where are you living? What are you doing? What kind of preparations do you have to make? Yeah. So this was, this was, this was a tricky uh, stepping stone in my life because at the time I was playing in the, with Mike and CJ and the Zooters, but I also had another band in Vegas called automatic taxi star with a, uh, Tiffany, Freddie, and Ellie, and, and Rich Hughes, and and so we were. I was in two bands because at at the time I was like playing with Mike and CJ. I was like, you know, 
it's cool. We, we, you know, we did this for this long and I, I just want to do other things, you know, too. And I wanted to, you know, play different styles of music. So I had to tell both those bands that I'm not going to be available for seven months because I'm going to go do this film. And so Mike didn't like that. And so he's like, well, I'm going to record the record. And cause we were in the process of recording another record. And he's like, I, I can't, I can't, you know, do that. So I'm going to, you know, fire, find someone to, you know, to play drums and blah, blah, blah. Whereas the other band I was in on tag star, I was like, Oh, this is great. This would be a great opportunity for us to yeah. further, further art. You know, I was really pissed off at Mike for about, let's say about five, six years. I didn't talk to him. I was like, cause well, I think, you know, yeah, I was, I think he was very passionate about that project. His name is on it. And yeah, so, know, so was I, so was I. So, yeah. But you know what I mean? When you're hungry, I think sometimes you get into this attitude. It, looking back, it's insane. You, you, were you supposed to pass up a, a, a chance of a lifetime that, that you know, I, to make right, records that right. might not be heard? Right. That's what I. That's what I told Mike. I said, Mike, dude, this is a great opportunity for us, man. Let's we can do the drum tracks in L.A. I'll be out here living. I mean, how much better could it be to record in a studio out there? I don't know. Whatever. He didn't want to do it. So well, it's and, fine. And, we're buds and, now. Everything's on there. To, you know. Right, that's a good thing. Bridge. But you know. Me, I would have said, you know what? I'm going to keep this guy in the band. I'm going to sell some records because this guy's just about to be in a Hollywood movie. No one knew how big yeah. this movie was going to be. Yeah. But it wasn't – it was definitely – with that cast, you had to have a hunch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so you take a – so you, you, you leave the band. You take a break from your other band. What but the funny thing is when I was living in L.A., I joined another band. I met up with some – some some dudes out there. Hal De Becker was a was a, a musician here in Vegas who was he and I were doing sessions and stuff together and writing and on another side thing. And Hal De Becker was like, "Hey man, I'm I'm in L.A. I know you're doing this film. Would you want to come down and jam with these guys? I've been jamming with and stuff." And, and that was a band called Orson who who went up to have a, a deal with Mercury and stuff. Um, it was a huge success in England and stuff. And so I was in a, a band out there and, and I was just like still working as a, as a, you know, a musician writing music with those guys as I was doing the almost famous thing. And I was also playing coming back and forth to Vegas to play with uh, automatic taxi star, the, the original, other original rock band I was in. So <laughs> now it's about playing music, man. That's, that's all I wanted to do. Well, that was, that's your thing. Now I yeah. don't know. Uh, excuse me for not remembering, but is that is, is that your real hair? Did you have to grow facial? What what was you tell yeah. me? So then, so they said, let your hair grow out, and let your beard grow out. I'm like, okay, no problem. But the they did end up using extensions on my hair to to make it look longer. And then they and then that was my facial hair. But it was really weird. Like it's like odd. Like it came down, but it didn't connect. You know, right here. I was like, I was like, this looks like shit. <laughs> but. They liked it. But you had to live with it. Like when you're playing. I did, yeah. Oh. You to be that guy. Yeah. Yeah. Which, listen, all these things are very nice problems to have. And the other thing is, and, you know, not to get into your finances, but obviously seven months pay on a feature film is not oh, a bad thing. Dude, movie business is, is, is good business, man. That's the business you want to be yeah. in. Oh, man, it's great. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. People are going to treat you. A lot better than they treat you playing the local club, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and let, let alone, dude, they, they put me up in a, an apartment in Marina Del Rey. You know, it's, I didn't have to pay for that. They go, well, we have to relocate you because you, you live in Vegas, so we're going to set you up in Marina Del Rey. Marina Del Rey, okay. Mm, okay, let me think about that. Come on. And then when we were, tra you know, when we were traveling to New York and all that, it was all first class and stuff. It's music, the movie businesses. Good business to be in. Yeah, for sure. And so the drums are already recorded. The songs are done. So you yeah. don't have to record them. Obviously, you have to learn them and you're going to play them um, yeah. a lot. You play to the tracks live. So you meet the guys for the first. Now, you knew Mark, obviously. Yeah. Um, but now you're going to meet the other guys who are actors. You two are the musicians. These two are the actors. Jason Lee is going to lip sync to tracks yeah. that are recorded. Yeah. And uh, Billy Crudup is going to play guitar, but and now he was trained by Peter Frampton and some other people at the time, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so we did, like, it was cool, man. So we, we had this rehearsal space in uh, Santa Monica, I think it was, and we'd get together, like, weekly, a couple days a week, and just 
jam out to the track and play and hang out and like be a band, try to be a band and try to hang out with each other and get that whole vibe going, you know? And it totally happened. Jason and, and Billy were great guys to hang out with. Super funny, accommodating. They didn't, they, they exposed themselves to, you know, anything we wanted to ask them about and, and um, totally approachable, totally approachable cats, you know, and, and all that. So. And on the other hand, they were probably learning from you guys. You know, as much yeah, as you're learning, you guys are musicians. You've done this, right? Yeah, yeah. They were, they were, they were feeding off the vibe of hearing live drums and hearing live bass and stuff like that. So that was, um, that was great. It was great. And they're very believable. I mean, yeah, man. If you watch the movie. I don't think you would know that. You know, uh, so that these yeah. guys are. So, you know, the cinematographer, John Toll, or director of photography, I'm sorry, director of photography, John Toll, friggin' amazing cat, man. He was, uh, he also did Thin Red Line, I believe. So John Toll was the the director of photography. And I think he had, he had a lot to do with how we looked and stuff, man. He was a true professional. Well, in those live sequences, you know, uh, Billy Crudup and his character, obviously Russell, yeah, the, it's lit so that you can't exactly see what he's doing. He yeah. has feel, he knows where to turn, he knows how to use the, and obviously the DP knows how to film this to, to sell it. And it doesn't, because there's a lot of music movies out there right. where you go, this is very fake. I also don't yeah. think you look at him and think that he's an actor from the other things he's done. You you believe that he's that guy, which is- Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Did, did, so, the guitar solos are played by Mike McCready of Pearl Jam. Um, mm -hmm. Did Nancy Wilson play some of the rhythm guitar? I think she did. I'm not. I can't remember that, but she was always the, on set and and kind of like instructing, you know, Billy and and stuff. And she was at our rehearsals a lot, hanging out, and then um, just you know talking about rock and roll and how to be a band and stuff to those guys and stuff. Because Mark and I were like, you know what. You know, you know, we know what it is to be in a band, you know, and stuff. So, but those guys, you know, they didn't, you know, they didn't really, they didn't know. This that. has got to be so cool to you, though. <laughs> oh, dude. Be Peter Frampton and Nancy Wilson in the same room, you know, and I was just like, I do I, I was like, do I talk to them? I don't know. What, what do I say to those guys? <laughs> you know? Right. You know, but well, then, and then, at, and then at the rap party at the Palladium, I got to play with Peter Frampton. We played like four songs. And it was like, Oh my God, this is come true. Awesome, dude. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. We're looking at some pictures of Stillwater. Yeah, man. Watch the drummer in the back. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, they, they, they kind of buried you back there. Um, but now, listen, yeah. this is a, an iconic picture because this is going to go on to be on the cover of the Rolling Stone. Right. And uh, right. now, do you have a copy of that Rolling Stone? I think I do. I have it in my, in my archives. And you know, there's a bunch of vinyl records that were printed, well, the covers too. I have to have all those too. Yeah. Well, I, I, first of all, every kid's dream is to end up on the cover of the Rolling Stone, as the song says. Here it is. Yeah, yeah. I do have that somewhere. I do have it in my archives, yeah. Yeah, you went the roundabout <laughs> way, but you, you accomplished it. And they, and they do make merch items of this. Yeah, I want to talk about the records as well, because Cameron has a really cool thing on YouTube where he shows, he has, there's three albums, yeah. Uh, he, he really created this universe for Stillwater, as far, even having their albums, and I got, a lot of it's borrowed from the Allman Brothers. But the third album has this amazing gatefold that you're in. You know, Totally. Yeah. And I have that one, too. That's that's great. Yeah, I have that yeah, one. I mean, I think, I, think I, I, I sent a copy to my mom and dad, and they have it, they have it like in a frame in their house and stuff. It's pretty cool. <laughs> It's like, you know, it's like when you're a kid, you pretend that you're going to be a movie star, you pretend you're going to be a rock star, but now you get her, all this thing is happening and, you know, and they're paying you for it. Yeah, absolutely. But so, okay, so, so talking a little bit, a bit more about uh, working with these guys who, you know, who are actors, at the time they weren't as famous, obviously, as they would all become, um, you know, and, but I'm sure, you know, people know who they are because this is a crazy ensemble cast. I don't think people realize how many people were in this movie. And then also how many people were going to get known later, like Mark Maron, the comedian. 
I had no yeah. idea he was in the movie. You know, that's like, right. oh yeah, he's in there. It's Rain Wilson, you know. Rain Wilson for sure. Who is that super nice guy? Philip Seymour Hoffman obviously was in in two and uh um yeah, um Peruza and a lot of people that I don't a couple people that I don't know if they even got they even got they may have gotten cut out, you know, on the editing room floor or something, but, but what's, yeah. what's funny is at the end credits of this movie. Uh, you know, your name <laughs> is billed like you know above some of these people who go on to be these, uh, you know, yeah. such famous actors. What a cool experience! Yeah, no, yeah, and that was that was the thing. You know, I was, you know, Cameron, you know, enlisted me as a principal actor, which made all the difference. You know, if I was, if I was, you know, assigned as a, you know, a, what do you, a, you know, a day a day player or whatever you want to call it or something. Mm -hmm. which would have made sense because I'm part of the band. So, but anyway, that, that's what made the difference. Yeah. Cause I was in every scene with the band and. And you have to get in the, you, you, you had to join the screen actors guild at this point. Yeah. So that, that happened like automatically. So that was, that was super cool. I didn't probably got it. some benefits from that too. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, cause I remember I, like after I did the film, I uh, went mountain biking and I, and I uh, went in Moab and I fell off my mountain bike and I had a hairline fracture in my wrist so I was like, oh, fuck, that sucks. And then I got a cat and I was like, oh, I didn't I have health insurance. No problem. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, so we're looking, we're looking at a photo here of some of this amazing cast. I mean, you couldn't fit so, everybody. Like in this picture, you can just tell that like I was hitting craft services heavy, dude. Right. Look at me right there. I'm like, I'm like 20 pounds overweight. <laughs> You well, but you know what? I mean, maybe it's just me, but I feel like that would fit the character. I feel like a drummer at that time would might might have a little yeah. gut. John Bonham, yeah, totally for sure, for sure, man, yeah. But so, what is it like working with these people? I mean, again, and Kate Hudson obviously has very famous parents, Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. It's who, who, by the way, we're at our. So we did this huge blowout at a rehearsal studio uh, right before we were going to start. You know filming and stuff. So we had this huge party at the rehearsal studio and I'm playing, the, you know, I'm playing the track and whatever. And, and all these people there, I look Goldie Hawn and Kurt are like to my left and they're like rocking out. I'm like, Oh my God, this is fucking cool. dude. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the cast, every, like I said before, you know, they were all like approachable people. They didn't have any kind of attitude or anything, man. Adam Taylor. Um, awesome cat we, we we talk about music and stuff he exposed me to some like bands from australia and and that i had never heard of and stuff and we talked you know talked about that and uh, uh jason lee was the funniest motherfucker man he's so friggin funny we just 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 about nothing you know we're laughing about like stupid nothingness <laughs> yeah it's um yeah, so everyone was totally cool, man. And I always say that they're very generous people and very approachable people. There was no ego or nothing. So, and they they treated Mark and I, you know, non actors, as equals and stuff. So it was really cool. What a great experience! And yeah, and there's other cameos in there in the scene where they're playing cards to figure out who's gonna get, get Penny Lane. Uh, um, Zach Ward. Who, who, he plays Red Beard in there, but he's the kid from A Christmas Story. You know, he, right. this is the bad, bad, the villain in The Christmas Story. I forgot about that. Yep, absolutely, he was. Yeah, he he was a cool cat too, man. Yep. It's just funny. So, when you're making the movie, does it feel like you're on this like big summer camp? Like, and also, are you traveling? Yeah. So it kind of felt like. I mean, to me, I mean, I was like uh, open arms to everything that were they were doing. You know, I was just like, "You want me here at six a.m. in the morning? I'm, I'm there." Um, yeah, it was kind of like that's a good that's a good analogy, like a little summer camp kind of thing. Um, but then, yeah, we and, yeah we did travel to New York City, and we would travel up to Sacramento. And I remember Cameron chartering a small jet that we all crammed on because he wanted us to have that experience of the jet. Mm. We had a private jet thing, so we flew that up to Sacramento, and uh, then we did all the bus scenes up. We did a lot of bus scenes up there because it kind of looks like the Midwest up there. And then, um, uh, then you guys get in a real bus, right? And the crew, yeah, follows. yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. So that bus was really cool. It's old, you know, old like tour style bus. It did have bunks and stuff in it. And then they had this like track on the ceiling that had a camera attached to it. So it, it'd be a, like a steady cam on this track in the, in the, in the ceiling of the bus. And um, that was pretty cool. Uh, and they had all this, you know, lighting rig like attached to it, you know, as we're driving so that the lighting was perfect. You know, John Toll, you know, not, you know, director of photography knew all about that kind of shit. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. And again, you don't have to worry about lines. You, you right. go where they tell you to go. You react yeah. when they tell you to react. Yeah. And, and uh, you, and you make it work. As a, I know I got to ask a question of my own fan question that I thought when I watched it was, where was Max's Kansas City filmed in the movie? Um, God, I think that was that was in New York. Well, so, New so, the, so the original Max's Kansas City was the Rock Club in New York, started the New York yeah. Dolls, everybody played there. Uh, it's yeah. a Korean deli now. I don't know if maybe in 2000 it was still a – God, I think that was. I thought. I thought that was there. Yeah, so that might be. I could be wrong, man. I don't know. I could be wrong, but I thought yeah. that was there too. Well, it, it, I think it might be because it certainly looked authentic. This yeah. movie has a very authentic look for everything. Never does it feel um, forced. I'm a New Yorker. I've seen these places, and then just the ideas that Led Zeppelin would be at the Plaza, and you guys would be. I think it's the Gramercy Park, or what. These are all things that make sense. Obviously, Cameron, being a writer and being a rock historian and fan paid attention to those little details. And yeah. so I think my favorite scene is when we're, they're doing Misty Mountain Hopper, we're coming over the bridge. Do you remember mm -hmm. that scene? Yeah. And you're asking about uh, William, how, how, how it happened, you know, how did he get like lucky or whatever? And I, and they're, they're playing Misty Mountain Hop and, and say, like, and then I give him that nudge. I go, what's up, dude? Did what happened? You know, you go back and watch that scene. That's like my favorite scene, man. Cause I give him a nudge and I'm like, Dude. That yeah, that's that's so funny because I you know I was thinking when I watched it, I kind of just thought it was it seemed innocent to me. I you know everyone told me well then you know he loses his virginity. I go oh I guess that's that did happen, but it, the movie yeah. plays it so you, I, I'm not sure Absolutely. you know yeah Absolutely. so I definitely gotta uh, watch that again. And the, you know there's so many different editions of this movie. Um, yeah. yeah. I hear the untitled one. That's the one that Cameron recommends. Is uh, is that's the one I recommend too because I, there's more scenes than me in it. <laughs> yeah. So, See. Yeah. yeah. So that we're all gonna we're all gonna go watch that now. Let, look, we're gonna talk about scenes with you. We cannot uh, skip this scene. This is your your big moment. I would call mm -hmm. this your coming out. Uh, no pun intended. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. And then, and I gotta say another thing about the my lines in this. So when we did the re table reading, it was only scripted as I'm gay. So that was what was scripted. That's what camera wrote. And then I added fuck it. And mm -hmm. camera was like, oh my god, that's great. Fuck it, I'm gay. So that sets it up. Yeah, I've had, I've had a horrible mouth my whole life. So and I got in trouble with my mouth. But I was like. And fuck is like one of my favorite words. So there it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think, you know, I think that makes so much more sense, though. You're in this situation. Yeah. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. So that's why I added it. So, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I, I, I'm, I'd rather hear from you. I, I can hear from me all the time. But yeah. uh, what a great, uh, what, and what a great moment. It's obviously, it's so it's funny. So you're in this movie where you don't speak. But yet you do have one of the more iconic lines and iconic scenes. And, you know, I, I was talking to you earlier about these, uh, you know, collector conventions and, and all these things. And I said, you know, people would love to meet you. You're going to be writing I'm gay, though, for the rest of your life. I know. Um, I, have, I have to re re reenact that line like like for for like hours. Well, I thought that, too. I Five, thought bucks. Every Five dollars every time I have to say. <laughs> I thought everyone wants to hear you say, fuck it, I'm gay, you know. Right. Uh, you know, I it get, sounds better when you say I do get that a lot. Yeah. But uh, anyway, this well, is a the cool thing about the scene, too. You know, remember when the pilot opens the door? Mm -hmm. It's like it opens. And it's like, and then that's right, at, you know, right after I say my line and like I slam the door. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that was, that was totally unscripted, too. No one, you know, no one told me to do that or anything. I was just like, oh shit, you know, slam the door. I don't, 
you know, it just exposed something I didn't really want to expose. You, know? <laughs> you, you were working with it, you know, and, yeah, totally. and for anyone who's had to be on a small plane, I was working with a band and we had to get, uh, it was, I was working, it was with a band winger and we had to get on one of these tiny little planes to go from, I think Arizona to Vegas. And I didn't want to do it. And uh, yeah. Paul Taylor, who's the keyboard player, he actually refused yeah. to do it and rented a car and he nice. wouldn't do it. So I thought, well, this is rock and roll. These guys do this all the time. I'm the only one who's a chicken because I didn't want to do it either. Turns out they were all so scared. Red Beach <laughs> goes up to the pilot before we take off out on the tarmac and he goes, so you've done this a few times, right? And, and he wasn't kidding. And, right. uh, and we just all sat on this play like, but this movie, has to be in everyone's mind. Obviously, it's a little bit. This scene is a little bit based off of the Leonard Skinner crash, even the location that they mention. But yeah, it this this definitely sets that moment. Uh, anytime there's turbulence, you know, you're thinking, what secrets do you have to reveal? Right, right. Good um, lord. <laughs> so, while you're making the movie, do do you have the feeling like I'm a part of something pretty big? At the time, yeah, absolutely did. And um, I was like, uh, thinking to myself, wow, this, you know, feature film. Um, everyone was saying, you know, every, and then everyone around the the cast, everything's like, are you ready for your life to change and all that? I'm like, yeah, but I, I know where my roots are, man. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna freaking freak out or anything like that about it, you know. But I don't know. It's been great. It's been great. It's been, it was a great, it was a great film to be a part of and a great cast to be a part of. And I have no movie regrets. Comes, movie comes out, yeah. does incredibly well in this is, and again, it's movies come out, come and go. This is a movie that is a part of history. You, you know, you'll, people will always talk about this movie. It's one of the great rock movies. Uh, and so, okay. So at this point, do you consider more acting? You know, at at the, at the time that I I stopped doing, uh, you know, we stopped working on Almost Famous many years ago. I was just like, uh, I'm just going to concentrate on going back to being a musician because I'd already sunk so much time into being a musician and paying my dues doing that. And I was like, I, you know, to to like flip it over and be, you know study start to study acting. I didn't want to do it at that time. I didn't want to like take another I don't know three or four years getting my acting chops up and stuff. I don't know. I, I, at the time I didn't want to do it. Maybe I should have done it. I don't know. I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of a shy guy anyway. I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't know, you know. Did you stay in I, LA? I, yeah, I, I actually moved to LA then. Yeah, I, lived, I was living up in Burbank up there. And so that's when I started working with that band called Orson in, in LA and stuff a lot. And we played all, all over LA and whatnot. And, and even, then- A year later. This happens. Yeah. So yeah. So I was living there, and Cameron was like, "Hey, can you got you and Mark want to come down and just like do a cameo in this film that I'm doing now?" I'm like, "I'm not gonna say no." It's, of course, man. I'm coming down right now. Where do you need me? Yeah. So we ended up we ended up going down, and 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 Cameron was there, and Tom Cruise and Penelope Cruz were were there. So we met them and. So basically, we were just like, just make fun of Tom Cruise and, and when he's at the bathroom and just hear, say this and say that. I'm like, okay. And so, so I mean, I've got to ask, because this is obviously a little bit of a bizarre movie, and people want to know. Cameron is also known for interlinking his movies. That's a, one of his things he does. There are <laughs> themes. And so does he tell you that you're playing? Are you Ed Valancourt in this scene? I guess so, because I think I'm casted as Ed. Aren't I? I think I'm casted in the in the as that, but no, he doesn't. He doesn't. He, he I don't remember him saying that. Yeah. Did, so he never gave you an explanation of why you're there or what it means. No, no. But no, you're right. He does link his films absolutely, but he never says anything to me like, so you know, this, this is the secret or anything like that. Right. Yeah. It's this movie is up to interpretation. And oh my God! Saying, I, I don't even to this day. I don't even. There's so many theories. I can't even begin to think about what they all could be. But great. Yeah. Film. And and so and again, you're, you're all of a sudden you're back in the acting game. You know, it's a small part, but there you are with Tom Cruise. You know, speaking. No, speaking I, I, of I, I, totally. Mark Mark and I were hanging out in the same 
the uh, uh, trailer and I'm like, how's this? So I was like, I had to call my dad. I was like, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm calling him on my dad on my phone. It was like, I just got to, you know, talk to somebody about what's going on right now. So I'm on a, another film set and he's like, what? And, uh, and, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So again, anyway, yeah, again, you're part of, uh, you're, you're kind of part of movie history, whether you planned it or not. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yep. I didn't and plan I'm it. Sure, <laughs> and I'm sure people are telling you at this point, hey, you know, you're in these movies. Um, you should consider doing more. And, and, and I'm yeah. sure you were wrestling with it. Absolutely. Gail, Gail Levin is the casting director for um, Almost Famous. She's like, you know, you need to live out here and then we can you take some acting lessons and stuff and I can get you going maybe in some other things and, st and stuff. And I, I, at the time I was just like, I don't know if I want to do that. It's probably dumb. I know people are probably put up and think, what? That's dumb. You should have done it. I don't know. I just, I just, like I said, I spent so much time developing my music career. So I just wanted to keep that going, you know? So I, at the time I was, I was doing both. I was acting and I was playing in bands. I was like fucking, this is great life right now. I'm playing in rock and roll. I'm playing rock and roll, writing music, doing records, and I'm also acting. So I guess it's the best of both worlds. At the time. It's a different time, and you're young. Also, it's not like you can then go on social media and turn yourself into I'm the guy from Almost Famous. Come, you know, yeah. come see me. It's it's a yeah. different thing. And I never did that. I never ever like kind of like tapped into like. Let's do some Stillwater songs or something. You know what I mean? I don't know. I don't... Listen, I'm I'm gonna try to change that, but because okay. my entire my <laughs> entire time in Vegas, I tell my friends, you know, when, when you know in here you see the local bands playing, and you are a working musician. You do a lot of the gigs. You know, go out and you know, you you are constantly working. You also do the Billy Joel tribute with Michael Cavanaugh, which you've been doing for a long time. But yeah. I always say. That's the guy from Almost Famous in that band. And people get excited, yeah. you know? And, no, then, and, and then they say, which one is? And I go, he's the one who says I'm gay in the plane crash. And people get so excited. And maybe they go see uh, uh, Spasmatics or whatever the, the band that you might be playing with for, the, for that night because they're yeah. so excited to see the guy from that movie. Yeah, I know. I don't, I know. It's time to no, cash I'm, in. I'm not, I'm not uh, a, a, like, I don't tap into celebrityism and the fascination with celebrityism in the United States, but I know it's a bit out there and people are, I like that. And sometimes I don't understand it, but that's, that's just me, you know, but I'm open to it and people want to talk about the film and stuff. I'm, obviously I'm talking to you about it. So I don't, I don't have a problem with it. So, yeah, no, I mean, you, it was a great part of your life. You, you, you are not somebody who obsesses or cashes, tries to cash in on it. So no. we should talk, your acting career uh, was not over. Here we are. Now it's, I believe, 2005. You've only worked with some of the, you know, most famous and great people. Might as well throw Steve Martin into the mix. Yeah. So the that is funny because I the Steve Martin wrote that little. They call it a novella. So a novella or whatever. It's a little, you know, a little short story. Like a so romance novel. Yeah. Totally. So, and I read that and I was like, oh my God, it's really good. It's a really good friggin' book. And so how did that happen? Mark was casted again first because the director of this film loved Red House Painters and loved Mark Koslick. And Mark was like, you got to come help me do this film again. And they need a band. Excuse me. And, um, I'm like, okay, that's I'll do it. Yeah. So that was that was a few days, and then the bass player for, in that band. What was the band's name in that film? Like something that weird. One I Shit, like screaming torsos, or I don't know. I can't remember the name of the band in the film. But the bass player from the band Low, he was the bass player in that, and then you know Mark had an original song in that, and and uh, yeah, because Mark was original. Mark's really a singer and a guitar player. Uh, yeah. For Stillwater, he played bass. Right, exactly. And so, uh, um, yeah, it was, that was a good few days of, uh, of filming up in like, you know, we filmed up in uh, Santa Clarita area, I think, we, and in LA for that, and a uh, couple days. And um, it's fun, you know, it was a cool, cool little. What is Steve Martin like? I'm sorry? 
What is Steve oh, Martin like? You know, at the time, I did not meet Steve because he he had not he wasn't in any of the scenes that we did. But I did meet Jason Jason Schwartzman himself, and he was a funny guy, totally funny. Obviously, a drummer. Remember, he was in that band Phantom Planet and stuff at the time. That's right. Yeah. And I remember him coming up and going, "Dude, man, it's like you don't make any money being a musician." I'm like, "Really, dude? You just figuring this out now?" Because <laughs> you know he's he's a great actor and stuff. I go, I go "Dude, he's just a stick being an actor, man." I don't know, man. So, but yeah, he he's, he's a good drummer. He's a rock, he's a good rock and roll drummer. Yeah, it's it's uh it's funny how that all works out. So I gotta ask you, um, if, have you stayed in touch with any of these people now, Mark? You know, I, I'm not going to ask you your opinion, but he's in trouble, you know, in different capacities. I yeah, I read that. No, I haven't haven't really kept in touch with most people. A lot of the production people, um, I kind of keep in touch with here and there. Um, Andy Fisher, who is Cameron's assistant at the time, um, he and I have been contact, you know, going back and forth about stuff and uh, stuff that he's releasing uh vinyl records and stuff and because that was the name of production company vinyl films was cameron's production company so so camera or, and so andy was uh developing the side of his production company to release vinyl records and stuff as well so it, i think there's going to be something released in the future with a lot of outtakes of stuff that we were talking about on set and stupid songs we were singing and coming up with at the time and so that's something that's coming up in the future. So. That sounds great. I, and I, I, you know, I could see some kind of featurette with where Ed Valancourt is now. You know, Cameron's so into these characters and this, right? And uh, you know, so maybe we haven't heard the the last of of, of that that interaction. Maybe uh, not. And you know, obviously, you turn on your TV, you still see these these people that you worked with because they're all working. Yeah, totally. Um, what was I going to say about uh, something? Uh, this artist I, I work with, I started working with Sophia McIntosh. She's like a Nashville girl. She's really young, and I've been, we've been, we've been, I've been shooting her demos. She sent me songs. I do demos for her here, and and shooting them back. And awesome artist. If you if you want to check her out, Sophia McIntosh. And she just because she's younger, you know, her dad just exposed her to the film. Almost famous, so she just saw me in that film like last night. I think he, he texted me today. Sophia just watched your film last night, and the only thing she said was, "Is that his real hair?" <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you know that movie. You know, you, even though the subject matter, like we said, it is done pretty tastefully done. It's not for what the subject is at times. It could it could have been a lot crazier. I think a teenage kids probably love that movie. I I, I yeah, I totally agree. Totally agree. But so hopefully when the, when we get back to playing, which is starting to happen, you're playing now, you played in Las Vegas last night, you, you, you know, you're starting to work and then hopefully um, things will happen with this, with the country artists as well. Yeah, the, you know, they're um, going down to Nashville to work with their producer this week and he, he just texted me today. He's like, do you mind if I use some of your stuff you played on the demos? I'm like, of course, go ahead, go ahead, yeah, yeah. use them, yeah. Which I recorded right in this room right here, right there. So it's funny. Yeah, you can, cool. It's funny what you can do nowadays, man. So, and I, I mean, I don't have a big production here. I, it's like I got some really great microphones, and I use Logic and just send them the tracks, and you can do whatever you want with them. You know, you know what I mean. So. Yeah, this is definitely not the Spanish influenza or the Black Plague. You know, even though it's a horrible time, you can quarantine at home and make music and be productive. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, um, so what's the, what, what plans do you have right now for the rest of the year that, that you know about? Cause I, I you know what I, I should say before I ask you that I left out that you've been playing drums with Asia featuring John yeah. Payne. And I know that Asia was a big influence to you. Absolutely. Carl Palmer. I saw them on their first tour coming through the United States. They had been their second or second night playing at the EJ Thomas Hall in Akron, Ohio. My brother and I went to see them, and I was just blown away, man. Totally blown away. Carl Palmer's awesome. You know, he plays traditional grip, you know, and which is, uh, you know, for people that don't know, this is, you know, matched grip, and then he plays traditional grip, you know. 
And I and a lot of my drummers back, a lot of my favorite drummers back in the day played traditional grip, you know, like that. Which a lot of drummers, and that's like a jazz grip or whatever you call it. Yeah, I think um, Clem Burke, Clem, Clem does the traditional, doesn't he? He might do that. You know, and back in back in the day, uh, Stan Lynch and Rick Allen from Def Leppard played played traditional grip. I was like, and the drummer from Kicks, K I X. Jimmy, he played. He's he played at the time. Treasure Grip, Stuart Copeland. Right. I'm off on a tangent, but those are no, those no. are some of my influences, and that's that's so that's why if so, if guys see me play or whoever sees me play, sometimes I, I switch off between traditional grip and match grip, and, and that's why because uh, a lot of my favorite drummers played that way, and then my drum teacher was like, "You got to play this way," and I'm like, "Fine." Well, we we're talking about drummers and we're talking about Carl Palmer. I, I got to tell this funny story. I always tell it off the air because I feel like it might be uh, controversial, but it's funny anyway. And I'll say it. a very famous drummer, legendary drummer once told me, listen to key to the moment and oh. listen to how, how bad the timing is of the song. The, Wait, the you say I bad, guess the but it's not, you say bad, but it's not bad. Is it bad? I'm not sure you said bad. Well, I don't think there's bad in me. I don't think that like, bad goes with music. Music, but it. I guess it's not uh, consistent. You explain it to people. Who no, 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 absolutely. So that's funny you say that because John was like, "Hey, can you send me a, a tempo map of here the moment? Because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna put it in, and we're gonna you know, we're gonna use it for a rehearsal track, and we're gonna put vocals in it." And I'm like, "Yeah, no problem." So I have, I have a tempo map of that song. And it does jump from a bit 10, 10 BPMs or so up, maybe more. And um, but that never bothered me. That stuff doesn't bother me. I don't like I don't like drummers overanalyzing or bashing Lars Bashers, Lars Ark Bashers. I yes, like I saw you speak about that. I liked your, your take on it. Stop it. Are you, do you have freaking gold records, silver, you know, uh, platinum records on the wall? I mean, Diamond. come on, man. stop it. Stop with the Lars bashing and all the drummer bashing. I used so, to ask. That, that said, I, don't, I don't mind that the tempo increases and stuff. I mean, it's like excitement. It, it, you don't, as a listener, you don't notice that. Do you? I don't know. I don't I know the average it. listener, you know, notices that. And I don't mind it. And I try to do that live with John when we play it. So I don't blame you. It's now part of it. Uh, exactly. Exactly. I don't know if the drummers that I'm talking about, and he literally, he is one of the best living drummers. I don't think he, he might not have said bad. I think he was causing it out. And maybe some of the other people listening were like, oh my God, but I like the way you take on it. That's, it probably adds character to that song. And the average person listening has no idea that drums can change tempo in songs. Yeah, come on, man. It's like, you know, if you, if you, if I just read the, the book, uh, Jeff Porcaro book, legendary Jeff Porcaro studio session drummer for a Toto and stuff. Yeah. He hated playing to a click. And, but that being said, he had impeccable time, you know, so he could, he could just totally lay back on the verses and then kind of take it up a notch for the choruses and stuff, which the average listener does not going to notice that, but it's like, makes all the difference, man. You know? So, and he, like I said, he, he hated playing the, to the click tracks and stuff. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think uh, music should be the kind of thing where there's a wrong way to do it. I think you said that right. I mean, I think. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, you know, with, with John and, and Asia thing, it's a, that's a super fun gig, man. I, I love playing that gig. And, and John is, um, he and I have collaborated uh, as far as setting up a studio at his home. So I had a whole other setup over there with all my, a whole bunch of mics and stuff. And we just tracked a record for a buddy of mine. Um, called Carving Marbles. This is his name is band, but they sent me some just really raw, raw tracks, and we ended up tracking about eleven songs for him. And he's so here, here's the state of how how musicians work nowadays. That musician George, his name, is living in Greece. Mm -hmm. Sends me the tracks. To his his bass player is up in uh, Northern California, so he he's collaborating from there. So I get all these like basic, basic, you know, demos. I write and I write out the drum parts. I send them all like a, I, set, I do a little demo here and I send it to him. How's this? Is this what you're feeling? And then I go over to John's house and we track it for reels. And it sounds so good over there. I got, I got a huge kid over there because uh, we're tracking Asia soft now. Yeah. So I have a huge, huge, like 
four toms, two floor toms, um, concert tom setup. So, um, so that we've been doing that over there too. So, um, which has been turning out really great. Yeah. And there, and there are some plans for that this year, right? Yeah. So yeah, right, right. We're in the process right now of just getting a, a, a track, one song that John had completely finished. So John has a bunch of songs that aren't finished. They're in demo form, but they sound really good, man. He's been, he's got some, uh, really good. I think the fact that we worked on this carving marbles record from of my buddies, it kind of got him inspired how the studio works. And we worked out bugs in there here and there. And now it's a streamlined process, how we can record. I think that inspired him to start really getting into uh, writing really hooky melodies and hearkening back to kind of the first Asia record and, and taking some earmarks from there and coming up with some good shit. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you still do Michael Cavan off the, the Billy Joel tribute as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Michael, I've been with the longest time, actually the longest time for the longest time. Good, good um, pun. Yeah. Like <laughs> no, we just did a gig up in St. George. We did a symphony gig up there and that's what we do a lot of. Mostly we do a lot of symphony back dates um, all over the country and stuff. So, and we're just starting to get back into doing that. Um, and uh, my, I've been with Michael for uh, 17 years playing with him, who's another Northeastern Ohio guy who, when living in Northeastern Ohio, we never crossed paths. So we only met when we were, out, we were living out here. So it's, yeah, it's, it's funny how that, that happens. And yeah. so you get to play really great, timeless music. I mean, if you know, couldn't yeah. be more between Asia and Billy Joel and then the other rock stuff you play. Yeah, I mean, with, with John, too, I mean, he's got that other 80s rock tour kind of concept going where we're playing with Lou Graham and Steve Algieri and Mickey Thomas and Robin Zander and Fee Wable. Um, I, th I think we have some dates coming up with uh, John LaFonte, who was a singer for Kansas for a while. Um, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try um, to link some of this uh, in the description so people want to check out um, what you've done and also what's coming up. We'll have that yeah. down there. Uh, yeah, totally, totally. And I'm really glad that you, you you wasted a little time with me. Uh, I don't look at it that. It's a good title, though. Um, hey, man, I, I dig talking to you, Jason, man. It's all good. And call me anytime you want, man. Yeah, so, and next time we'll talk about uh, getting you to play some, some gigs, uh, with, with, you know, with all my things, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun. So I appreciate you sharing these stories, some of these things going back. You know, we're, we're, it's great that we can talk about a movie that's 21 years old. Yeah, I just hope I, I hope I explained everything clearly enough for everyone to understand. <laughs> I should have probably let the audience ask questions. Maybe we'll have to come back and do that because I'm sure people have their own yeah. thoughts and visions and things. We could do that about. another time. Absolutely. It's, it's, it, as long as my memory serves me correctly, I can, I'm sure I can answer any questions. You know? so. I think your memory is pretty sharp, Johnny. So right, I man. appreciate everything and we will talk again. Thanks, Jason.